is that a lot of organizations have had some of uh, some litigations or legal issues which has caused them to respond by having uh, from having to to actually respond to a legal ramification with diversity. And so one of the things I want to talk about is when you so so when you have those issues, a lot of times you'll see maybe an organization doing some really great things in the community and you'll find out later it's as a result of that. So what I will say is most organizations, aside from that, create diversity and inclusion uh, for, uh, for the workforce. Uh, they do it to drive their culture. And we know that diversity and inclusion is a huge return on investment for organizations. Now, how do you build that business case around that? Each organization might be different. But it is a big attract, retain, and development for us. It's how we attract talent, retain talent, and uh, develop the talent that we have. And when you look at the U.S. population, we know somewhere in 2030, we're going to be dealing with a truly multicultural society where people will likely be uh, two or more races. So uh, how do we approach that with the new with consumers and the marketplace, how do you drive that? Uh, diversity, uh, oftentimes, is one of the huge benefits to organizations. And so, we have a internal, external strategy of which our diversity and inclusion is uh, our workforce culture, culture which is internal, and then our community and marketplace which is external. And so, that is how we combine our DNI efforts. Uh, and uh, we uh, really uh, try and sustain the work that we do uh, through embedding it in not just uh, uh, in our HR department, which is where I would love to, but we embed that uh, into all of our practices around our organization. And I'll, I won't go much further than that in case you guys have questions, but, but in scope it is uh, the, the value of a sustained uh, DNI effort is, is of the utmost importance, particularly uh, now more than ever for most organizations. So you'll see a lot of diversity and inclusion, uh, chief diversity officers, directors starting to pop up more and more in organizations because they're starting to rec recognize how important it is uh, to attract and retain and develop talent. Um. I just have a question for all of you here. How, what do you? What is your definition of diversity and inclusion? If anyone wants to raise their hand, go ahead. Diversity is the theory. Inclusion is the application. Right. So that's the way I look at it. Right. And um, so I come from a small organization, and I was kind of joking around and saying that I am their <laughs> diversity initiative at this point, but it's hard when it's a smaller organization to expand into a program that, you know, and really uh, find talent and retain talent um, that is a larger organization like Nestle Purina. But I did a presentation on um, the Asian, uh, the bamboo ceiling, the Asian Americans face, our Asians face that are coming to, um, that are in, um, the workplace that face in getting into managerial roles or executive roles or even moving up the organizational chart because of their cultural uh, bringing. So, for example, um, because uh, because of their sometimes cultural upbringing, you know, to be subservient, to not ask for things that they want now, or you know, and not being taken seriously. And I face that not only sometimes as an Asian American, but also as a woman. You know, so there's multiple levels of, you know, and bamboo ceiling came with the term glass ceiling, you know, for women and moving up that part. So there's so many dimensions when you're talking about inclusion and diversity and where do you where do you even start um, addressing the challenges in an organization. For me, um, I'm starting small in my organization by making sure that executive level women are hired. That's all. 
almost the only people that I introduced to our CEO, you know, of a small organization is women with talent and and um, that and he, he's like, you know, you, you've really expanded my eyes and seeing that how talented you all are. Hard hard areas that we're finding because we're a software company is finding talent in the software development area for us. It, uh, what, we have Asians in the software development area, um, but we are trying to include women, other minorities, Hispanics, African Americans, and things like that. But it's hard to find those talent, that talent, and how do you expand an organization to include diversity and inclusion when it's a small organization? So those are some of the issues that I'm facing. And uh, so to, to just piggyback on the uh, the uh, gender is that's also another challenge. Usually when you think about diversity and inclusion, I like to say diversity is the mix, inclusion is how you make the mix work, okay? Uh, so uh, race and gender is always the two biggest uh, dimensions of diversity that people think of most, right? And mostly because that, those are the ones that the federal, if you're a federal contractor, which we are, those are the ones that you really have to report on. Okay, and so what I'd like to say is, what I'd like to look at is the compliance part of uh, uh, that is different for me. I, my office is next door to the compliance person, and she counts, she has, her role is to sort of count heads, and that is not my role. So my role is to, treat, uh, to create a strategic, sustainable initiative that is embedded into everything we do. So for example, when you think about genders, to your point, one of the ways we look at uh, gender is how do we create women in the secession pipeline and uh, people of color. So one of the ways we do that is we have a, uh, how do we get women into ready now? Because we say, if there's a position available, is she or he or her ready now? Or is it one to two years or three to five years? Guess what? Women are typically in the three to five year uh, timeline. Why is that? It's because women often don't raise their hand for promotions. And, and there is data to support that a woman will look at a position that is a promotion and she will say to herself, I feel like I need to be 90% you know, knowing that position well. Guess what a man, how, what's the percentage of what men think when they see a position that's a promotion? 75. 75. 60. So a man only feels that if he is 60% qualified, he will go after that position versus a woman will wait till she's 90%. And guess what? Oftentimes, 50% of the time uh, is knowing the position, and the other 50 is what you bring to that position. So you you don't have to have you don't have to be ninety percent qualified, and women don't act. So they sit back and they think that they don't qualify, and therefore their male counterparts are the ones that apply and then get the position. So that is one of the things. The other is biases. We all have them. So we one of the things we do is we have unconscious bias in the workplace. It's not mandatory, and, uh, but we do require and engage people in a e-learning or a four-hour facilitated on unconscious bias. And there's things like, uh, what's in the name? So, will John versus Jihad get the job? So when people say, well, we don't, we don't, have, we don't see them, it's all telephone screen. Well, it's not because you see a name. Or the resume may say he's the president of the uh, Black Student Union. There's things on that resume that reflect that you've got a diverse candidate. Okay? But uh, so what, what and it has been, uh, so uh, theory has shown through unconscious bias, 
Uh, has anybody taken the implicit bias? So then you know, even yourself, we all have it. What we're trying to do is create the awareness. So once people are aware, because you have conscious bias, and sometimes you're for something. You're for it. You consciously know your bias towards it. And you're okay. You, you wanted the Patriots to win. But there are other times that you are unconscious. And that is where we try to get the organization to be aware of what their unconscious bias is at the time of decision making. So when it's around talent, uh, uh, in terms of attracting talent, doing the recruiting process, also during the time of succession planning, and also who gets those plum assignments. So those are some of the ways that we try to counter uh, gender bias and uh, other biases that uh, are active in the workplace. Um, and I think uh, it's a West Coast company and it's purely Microsoft, I think, is partnering with Stanford where, for the Asian American community because I kind of did the uh, Stanford University is to train Asian Americans on executive, you know, uh, the succession planning and how to ask and you don't have to you know, the 60% that, you know, you can ask when you're 60% ready, you know, you don't have to ask, you don't have to be 90% to take that job, so, and to speak up, and those are very important traits, but one of the things that I wanted to bring up, and since we're here kind of informal today, is talk about where diversity and inclusion really start. It starts at an organization, but in general, it starts in a community, I think, and, you know, in the community, um, St. Louis, we have to figure out what is diversity and inclusion for our community, and that's where it really starts. Um, so to me, I'm glad I'm here because we really need to talk about that, and then if we're diverse and inclusive in our community, automatically our organizations are going to be diverse and inclusive. I, that's where I think where it really starts, and, and the education on that, and we don't want to have to force diversity and inclusion, right? No. You know, so how do we not force it? It's a lot of talking in panels like this. It's a lot of, you know, community outreach and things like that and being with members of other organizations and board members and things and talking about it. But talking about it and doing it starts, I think, in the community. So, and the community is a, a part of it much, particularly, uh, I'll use Ferguson uh, as an example. When we had the Ferguson uprising, uh, it was a time when uh, organizations wanted to try to figure out what, what is our response? How do, we, how do we respond to this? Because we were having uh, some of our uh, associates that lived out of state was coming in for meetings. They were saying, hey, are we going to be and they were looking at the are we going to be safe? And, and we're like, well, we're, we're, we're not near Ferguson. But what we had to come to realize was we are all a part of this region, regardless of where our zip code. Of course, Paula and I were going through Leadership St. Louis, and we did a whole race relations, and this was very prevalent during that time. In fact, we had a few folks that were intimately involved, and we became very intimately involved in Ferguson. So, uh, you, uh, my CFO said, what are we doing in that in Ferguson? And at that time, I was like, we weren't doing anything, so I didn't know, so, so I reached out to someone that I happened to know, and I said, how do we help, how do we get, but it took us a, it took a year, because corporations are like big cruise ships. They don't turn very fast. So the response, you don't want to over respond respond too quickly because you're not sure you know. And you've got your PR department, you've got your, your security department. There was a lot of people involved and we met to try to figure out what the what, what was the statement and the response. We finally decided we weren't going to make a statement of response because it really didn't do not publicly. But internally we were telling our associates that they were safe to come to St. Louis. Meanwhile from a DNI perspective, uh, I wanted to reach out to that community. So what we decided to do is, okay, we took our uh, multicultural uh, resource group, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about employee resource groups too, 
uh, and we we support uh, the Ferguson Youth Initiative through mentoring and job readiness. And last year we had youth jobs. This year we're in more of a mentoring and job readiness capacity. But it was our way of really saying, hey, we're going to go and give back to the community, community because in the end, the community is a reflection of an organization. We're all a part of this region. So uh, in the past, Farina uh, was very much focused on the near south side. And what we realized is it was north. And so for the very first time ever, we've had a footprint in north uh, uh, County because of Ferguson. And so, uh, but though, you know, that's an example of how you connect the community. We have 13 community partners. It's a lot of community partners, but we believe that we don't want to sign checks. We want to be actively engaged with our community partners. So, for example, uh, the OCA Pan Asian uh, group, uh, we might have them come in and speak like this to our associates. And to your point about the Asian culture, one of the things we, we learned was that uh, it, it, Asians oftentimes are very soft-spoken. And they may not look you in the eye. It's disrespectful to look you in the eye. So those are all those cultural, what I call cultural competencies, that are so important in the workplace because someone might think, if OK, you're not looking me in the eye, that means you're not confident. But that's, that's something that, so those behaviors are important to share with organizations uh, in the workplace. So when you talk about diversity and inclusion, it gets more than just about counting heads. It's about understanding different cultures and valuing differences. Yeah, and in a large organization like the Message Group of Korea, and they're having these initiatives, which is awesome. And it's, again, my, the whole point, I, I it's harder to do in a really small organization, but the only thing that it starts with one person. You know, the way I look at it, it starts with one person. I I joke about it with my bosses or whatever, but it starts with me joking about it, but then being really serious about it and saying, "Well, I need to with this candidate. She's great." You know, so starting in a small organization, it's about the introductions, the you know, the initiatives one person can take to make that organization more diverse and more inclusive. I mean, I'm a five. Well, we're expanding to twelve people. You know, soon and within a month. You know, started out as four, so going to twelve, and then hopefully by the end of the year, going to twenty. So in that organization, how am I going to make sure? That we don't have, we have gender diversity and inclusion. We have race diversity and inclusion, and sometimes both. You know, so head of sales is a Laotian <laughs> female, so, which is awesome, and she's awesome. And the, the one thing is that in an organization, we talk about diversity and inclusion, but we're not forcing it. We're bringing on candidates that are truly qualified. Yeah. You know, we're not, some organizations come in as reactive. So I think we were talking about it in the beginning, well, it's part of our program, you know, right? right? And that's not a great way to start. You have to be proactive about it and really bring on candidates that have all the qualifications, but maybe in the past because of being Asian and not looking someone in the eye or, you know, females have different, you know, they've stayed at home with their their kids for a while and then they come back to work, but guess what, they're caught up in, you know, um, five, the half the time this man maybe have, has caught up in the same environment. So we have to look at all these different issues and then bring that together, but a proactive organization doing it, like Nestle Purina, is very different than being reactive. Yeah, so, and, and what we, one of the things we do are behavioral-based interviews, right? So that's their, that's our approach to trying to say all things equal, right? You, you, we're we're going to talk more about uh, your story. So, for example, and I tell many, many uh, uh, friends or family or that, that's interested in positions at Prina, 
that phone, in the old days we called it a phone screen. It's a phone interview because they're actually uh, taking behavior. So say if there's a position for an accountant, for example, they may need to be result focused, they may need to show initiative and have insights. Let's just say those are the three competencies. Somewhere in that conversation, they will be looking to hear that coming from your story. So it's tell me about the time when. And you've heard that, right? So tell me about the time. So it's, it's less about your strength and weaknesses because what they're finding in organizations is we can teach anybody the actual technical applications for roles. What we cannot teach you is what's unique to you. So when we talk about diversity and inclusion, being able to bring your best self to the office, it's meaning your differences is what should make you uh, more, uh, more attractive in terms of, so you're unique. And, and, and when we think about diversity, uh, we often think about race and gender. But I want you to think about diversity of thought, uh, we also have LGBT, uh, we have disability, and those are becoming much more uh, prevalent in terms of how organizations are looking to attract talent. Uh, disability is becoming one of our, and gender balance, is one of our two big uh, key uh, initiatives because we're saying, hey, we need more women in the workplace. While we're at 50%, we're right about 48% women in our organization, right? That sounds great. But when it comes to senior executives or senior level, we go right way down. So that's, a, that's an area that we want to grow. So it's not that we need more women. We need more women in senior <coughs> level positions. In the so in the decision making. So right. that's a part of the, that's why organizations for us, we're building a strong succession pipeline. And our culture has typically been we build from within. So in Purina, I've been with Purina, guys, 40 years. I started out of high school, right? Wow. So I'm one of these unique <laughs> okay, that it is my first and it's going to be my last place of employment. Wow. So I can tell you that Purina values, uh, they grow from within the talent. Now, nobody, not to use, we recognize now uh, the uh, generational changes. We've got four generations in the office, and that in itself is another form of diversity, generations. Right. So we're looking at all of those other dimensions of diversity uh, that are impacting the workplace, and each generation has a different set of needs. And so how do you have this sort of uh, array of applications and offerings for the various generations that are in your organization. Because if you don't, you will have that leaky uh, pipeline of talent going out the door. So what we recognize is on average, your organization spends probably about uh, $17,000 per person to get them fully onboarded into an organization. Somewhere into that fifteen dollars to $17,000, right? So if I've invested that for you to come into the organization and then in, two, in a year you, you're back out, that's costing the organization. So retention is just as important as attracting. So it's not going to do us good enough to bring diverse talent in the door and then we don't keep them. So we recognize keep and retention is quite as important as attracting the talent. And I think in an organization, the HR person has a very difficult role of attracting the right people and being unbiased. Um, because uh, I can give a small example of a company that I know um, uh, here in town, and, and the HR person told me this, is that to, uh, it's a different technology company, and two software developers, male and female, same qualifications. Exact, and he's like, I'm hoping one of them had more experience than the other, because the male got $15,000 more offered as a starting salary versus the female. 
So um, those HR people have to go back to the CEO or the organization or whoever, maybe it's the chief operations officer, whoever is handling HR. And I, I, I handle HR. So in my work, um, they'll come back to me and say, did you know that you offered this person $15,000 less, is, she, is he more qualified, does he have more experience, does you know, all these things play. So that role is very important and to be very unbiased, again, also plays across not just gender, um, age, age, you it's know, you mentioned, you know, will this older person make less in the same role because, well, you know, he's a it depends, you know. So there's the, these are all the thoughts that an HR chief of HR has to go through, you know, and and really communicate that with the executives and, like you said, have succession planning and things like that, and really look at how do I hire and be unbiased, you know. I had a conversation earlier today with a friend who finds herself in that position. She's a middle-aged person back in the job market um, with a lot of experience in education, and yet she feels that because she's mid-aged and female, that she will not, absolutely will not, get the type of job that she deserves based on those factors. So, I mean, have you found that to be exceptionally true in the same situation? I mean, there's an argument to be made, right? But I mean, in most cases, some organizations value uh, older uh, uh, employees. One, uh, they're they're sort of more committed to longevity, where the uh, millennials or some of the Gen Xers and uh, or, or sort of hop every two years. So uh, sometimes it's, it's a benefit, sometimes it just depends on the organization and what they're looking for. But uh, we recruit through, one of the things we, we did, we've done very well is, is we recruit through what I always suggest is, do you have a LinkedIn page? And is your LinkedIn page uh, speaking to the position that you want. So, because a lot of times we do e-recruiting. So, we're just going through and finding, uh, as I say again, back to those competencies that they're looking for. And so, you'll get a, you'll get an outreach from us sometimes from through LinkedIn. And we found that to be with the, with the amount of uh, 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 recruiting that's required, we've got a pretty big talent sourcing team, uh, that the, the, e, the uh, LinkedIn strategy is that the e-recruiting allows us to, to, to really span that wider net. So for uh, age, and, and I would say state your case and make sure you have your LinkedIn profile updated so that you are visible to a bigger group or a bigger audience. I agree with that because they have very analytics behind them that organizations use to really hold it. Sometimes they're inaccurate. Maybe it's because the candidates aren't using the correct words, and uh, you're absolutely right to use the correct words in making your profile. Because I was just looking at my LinkedIn page, and it said I had five. Of, there was this one position open. I go, I have five out of the ten qualities for this job. I go, no, I don't. No, I have like nine. <laughs> you know, so so it's kind of different. And uh, but so just make sure that maybe you know they have LinkedIn. It's free, you know, and make sure that you take one of their little, watch one of their videos on how to put on a, a good good page. And I teach. Uh, I, well, I did teach at SLU, and um, I would tell my students who are going to law school and make sure you have a good LinkedIn profile, you know, and take, before you go to school, I, I was a non-traditional, I worked 
then I went to school, I worked while I was in school, so, you know, so I did all those things, I said, take those jobs and make sure that, you know, especially I talked to my, I, I'm big on gender and, um, and the gender wage gap <laughs> and pay gap and all that kind of stuff, so I always tell my female students that, and this is not just female based, I mean, you know, we have to look at all the different factors that are involved in it. But I think it's getting better. I want to. I have to leave here shortly, but I want to end on a positive note, and I think that um, it is getting better. Oh, okay. and, and in every organization, even the ones that were reactive, based on maybe some sort of litigation that they had or something like that. But even then, getting in the new people in place, the, the organizations are changing some more rapidly than others. And I agree, and, I, I, and, and one of the things I mentioned was you, you're seeing many more uh, diversity and inclusion practitioners uh, join us, uh, get, get hired. Uh, my role was created, and so you do what you're focused on. So you think that you have this great area that you're, you're doing in diversity and inclusion, but until you have a dedicated resource or a team to it, the acceleration happens so much more quicker when you have someone devoted to that uh, or have a focus on that. But if you're just relying on HR to kind of watch and do it, it doesn't happen. So what that's what the organizations are recognizing. They're also recognizing that uh, diversity and inclusion is not just nice to do, but in a business imperative. It's a business imperative, so it's no longer, hey, you know, we'll, we'll do that, but the budget gets cut because of D&I. No, D&I is a really in integral part of an organization's business <coughs> uh, offerings and their return on investment. So uh, I would say, you, 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 uh, and, and as, uh, as talent, uh, as the, the generations consistently share that place in the workforce. I think there's room for every generation in a workforce. You just have to know how to market yourself to that particular uh, uh, organization. And retaining talent at a workplace is important with the diversity and inclusion initiatives that companies are taking because when, you're in, when you are, have that um, for companies that are doing that, you're attracting people to your community, you know, people that you wouldn't think would move to St. Louis, you know, people from the East, East Coast, West Coast, why are you in St. Louis? Well, lower cost of living, but it's a diverse community, it's an inclusive community, and that's very important. Again. And that's, that's a really great comment because just yesterday, uh, there was uh, one of our HR business partners reached out to me and said, Annette, we're about to offer this guy, uh, make this guy an offer but he wanted to find out more about our diversity and inclusion initiatives. Ah. So he said, would you mind talking to him? I said, absolutely. So we, I spent an hour yesterday talking to this young man out of Virginia. So he was asking everything from, you know, what's our strategy? Uh, what do we have in the workforce? What's the balance to where's the right place to live? So, uh, you know, what part of town and, and things. And, uh, he, he made mention, he said, I've been there once and I didn't see very many people look like me. And I talked to my HR organization. When we talk, when we have our leadership meetings, I say, people of color will walk in an organization and they're going to look up. They're going to look up and they're going to look around because they want to see people who look like them. Because if I can't see somebody who looks like me, then success for me may not be possible because I don't see anybody that looks like me. And so that's the other reason why it's important. It's, it's uh, and, and oftentimes, uh, what's happening is when when organizations have uh, job opportunities, the external candidates are research researching the company as much as the company is researching the candidate. <coughs> so the job market is fierce, and the race for talent is in play. So what's happening right now in organizations are we've got a fairly low uh, job, uh, job market, right? Uh, so 
uh, top talent is hard to find and hard to keep. So the race for, for quality candidates and talent in organizations is always an optimal uh, uh, reach because it's so many organizations competing for some of the same talent. So I would say it is clearly a candidate's market. So if you're uh, uh, looking for uh, work and you've I can't imagine that you would not be able to find work. It may not be the idea, and this is one other caveat. When you're looking for work, sometimes you may not see the job you absolutely love, right? But sometimes take risks. Go sideways. It may, it may not be you're saying, hey, I want to take a promotion. Maybe take that lateral move because it's a strategic move because you're maybe getting into another area where you're expanding uh, your area of expertise and makes you a lot more attractive versus always trying to go up, go over, and then you go up. So think about that when you're in the workplace. That's a, that's a really good point because even in my personal example, I kind of took a pay cut to take my position because I wanted to learn some new skill sets. Um, it was kind of a strategic move on my part for two years from now. Where am I going to be? You know, and, uh, and my, my pay is going to go up to what I was making before, but in the initial run, I did take a little bit of a cut to, to make that strategic move to expand my skill sets to, so I can meet new people, <laughs> you know, get, get, new, get new skills, you know, get that profit and loss skills that I didn't have before and things like that, you know. So it's it that's a that's a really great point that we have put. And I know I mentioned the coaching, mentoring, and yeah. sponsoring, and I'll just tap on I'll touch on those really quickly. Uh, a, a, a mentor, uh, the, the, we talk about the three types of relationships. So a mentor, okay. A mentor is a person that talks sort of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Uh, in an organization, and every person should have a mentor. Uh, then there's the coach. Uh, that's a person that may be a little higher up the organization than you are, uh, and so that's a, they act as sort of like this advisor, you know, and they listen and they advise because they're, they're a little further ahead. And then the other relationship is a sponsor. So they say, mentors talk with you, Coaches talk at you, sponsors talk about you. You can pick a coach, you can pick a mentor, but your sponsor chooses you. So you can, so you can ask someone to be your mentor, you can ask someone to coach you. But a sponsor is a person, and it's usually a senior level person, who sees something in your personal brand that they will advocate for you. So if you ever are on a job and you find out, why does this guy always get the plum assignments? There's somebody in that room, because you're not going to be in the room. When they're talking talent, a lot of times there's people who can say, yes, I know Kevin, he'd be great for that position, because we do talk talent. We talk emerging talent, and we talk about top talent. And when we talk about who can take this role, who might we give this project to, we're looking across the board at what our top talent has. And uh, if you have a sponsor, sometimes you know you have a sponsor, and sometimes you don't. And uh, when you find out, it's a beautiful thing. And I'll end on this. My, my vice president told me, Annette, you know why you got this job? He said it was because of the three R's. I'm like, three, three R's? What are the three R's? He said, results, relationships, reputation. He said it so. So I, I use that since the yeah, like, oh, I have no idea what the three are. So and it's all about your personal brand. So on that I'd say uh, engage, uh, take risk, risk and uh, uh, go out into the world and make uh, diversity and inclusion uh, not just a program, but an initiative that's sustainable. So, thank you. Thank you.
that those are all the different ways I, I, I try and interconnect people uh, along the way where they would normally see a person uh, that they bias or stereotypes might say, but they're there. So, any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.